Hello friends, we're going to talk here about the somatic symptom and related disorders. This is a new heading in the DSM-5 and it replaces what we used to know only a couple years ago as the somatoform disorders. So the term somatoform disorders has gone the way of mentally retarded and hysteric and lunatic um, and is now in the dustbin of medical history. We no longer refer to these disorders as somatoform disorders. Why? I have no idea. But I guess the people who were making the DSM-5 decided that this mouthful, somatic symptom and related disorders, was a better term, uh, umbrella term, for these disorders that we're going to talk about. So unlike some of the other classifications in psychiatry that have came out with the DSM-5, the uh, somatic, uh, sorry, somatic symptom and related disorders has actually undergone significant revamping. And that kind of makes sense because what we previously knew as the somatoform disorders, we really don't, didn't know a whole lot about it, and we still don't know a whole lot about it. And this stands in contrast to the psychotic disorders, the anxiety disorders, and the mood disorders, which we've really been studying for a very, very long time, and we have a lot of information on that available. These disorders we really don't know a whole lot about. They're still kind of a mystery, and so you can expect that there's going to be a lot of change in the near future until we really get a grasp, if we ever get a grasp, of what these are. So the total number of disorders has been reduced. Um, part of that is because we are sort of reorganizing uh, certain disorders and considering them a subclassification of other disorders, and some of that is because we've actually moved disorders outside of the classification of somatic symptom disorders and under uh, the heading of other disorders, which I'll talk about in a little bit, the one that we moved. So somatic symptom disorder uh, was formerly known as somatization disorder, and the one major change to what we formerly knew as somatization disorder you're actually really, really going to like. We made a major change to the diagnostic criteria and now no longer does a patient have to have this constellation of four pain symptoms, two GI symptoms, one sexual symptom, and one pseudoneurologic symptom. Now all they have to have is one or more somatic symptoms distressing him or her. That's really nice, isn't it? Because the USMLE loved to throw at you a patient that looked just like somatization disorder, except if you go down the line, they had three pain symptoms, three GI symptoms, one sexual symptom and two pseudoneurologic symptoms. And because they didn't have the four pain symptoms, they only had three, it was not a somatization disorder and it would have been something else. Uh, so this really robs the test of a way to trip you up and it's kind of nice. So uh, the patient only needs to have one or more somatic symptoms distressing him or her and if they fit all the other criteria of somatic symptom disorder, which are largely unchanged, from the DSM-4-TR criteria of somatization disorder, then indeed they do have somatic symptom disorder. Now we used to have something called pain disorder and that was basically somatization disorder where pain symptoms were uh, had predominated. We've actually abolished that as a disorder in and of itself. Uh, it had been recognized for quite a while that it was very similar to somatization disorder and so now we classify pain disorder as a specifier of somatic symptom disorder. We consider it somatic symptom disorder with predominant pain. So it is actually under the classification of somatic symptom disorder. So pain disorder as its own independent entity is no longer. Nevertheless, with pain disorder, uh, I am going to talk about somatic symptom disorder with predominant pain uh, by itself because the management can be a little bit different. Illness anxiety disorder used to be called hypochondriasis. Why we changed the name of this, I don't know. Maybe because uh, we want to stress the fact that this is kind of an anxiety disorder, even though this is going to fall under the classification of somatic symptom and related disorders. Or maybe it's because the term hypochondriasis has a negative societal con uh, connotation, similar to why we probably changed uh, mental retardation into intellectual handicap. I don't know. Uh, but regardless, we have changed hypochondriasis to illness anxiety disorder. There have been some changes to the criteria. First of all, it can be diagnosed in patients that have objective symptoms, provided the preoccupation is clearly excessive or uh, it's disproportionate. Uh, now, 
what this means. Let's say that you have diabetes and you are obsessively concerned about your diabetes and about losing a limb and about having congestive heart failure because of diabetic plaque formation and having uh, silent MIs and you're terribly concerned about losing your vision and all that stuff. We used to not really be able to diagnose hypochondriasis in patients that have that because they indeed do have an objective medical disorder. And all of those things can happen if you have, in this case, diabetes. Now what we recognize is that even if the patient has objective symptoms, they have an objective medical disorder, if the preoccupation is clearly excessive or disproportionate, then yes, they can fall under this illness anxiety disorder formerly known as hypochondriasis. So it sort of widens the patient pool that can fall under this category. This also requires now, and even though we saw this before in hypochondriasis and it was actually a salient feature, now with illness anxiety disorder, it's actually required that the patient either perform excessive health-related behaviors, such as coming into the clinic frequently, coming into the ER frequently, complaining about the same thing and sort of anxiety related to it, um, or perhaps they are afraid they have diabetes because family members have diabetes, even though they objectively do not have diabetes based on our own testing, but nevertheless, they get a glucometer, take it home, and they're testing their blood glucose every day. Um, that would be excessive health-related behaviors. Or they may exhibit maladaptive avoidance, where they're so afraid they have something like cancer, for instance, that they don't come in to get their yearly physical, or they don't get their colonoscopy at age 50. That's maladaptive avoidance. That can be related to illness anxiety disorder too. So you can see that there can be various manifestations of illness anxiety disorder. Either the person is excessively obsessed with their disorder and they seek help uh, to a ridiculous extent, or they're totally freaked out about what they think they have that they don't come in at all. And we have two subclassifications of illness anxiety disorder, the care-seeking type versus the care-avoidant type. And you can imagine uh, how those criteria would elicit uh, one or the other of these uh, subclassifications. Conversion disorder is, uh, has really gone unchanged. Uh, we also know this as functional neurological symptom disorder. The criteria have been slightly modified to emphasize the essential importance of the neurological examination. However, for the most part, for uh, your purposes, uh, for the test, and in general for, for clinical practice, the criteria are largely unchanged. The subtleties, uh, you know, you can geek out about if you're a psychiatrist uh, or you work in this field, uh, but for, for our intents and purposes here, it's really the same thing. Body dysmorphic disorder is really the same as far as uh, how we diagnose it and the criteria. However, it's now classified under the obsessive compulsive and related disorders. And that's primarily because patients with body dysmorphic disorder, not only are some of their symptoms very similar to uh, the obsessive compulsive disorders, uh, but there is a high relation between patients with body dysmorphic disorder and a comorbidity with, uh, uh, with obsessive compulsive disorder itself. So some general principles of somatoform disorders or the somatic symptom disorders, I should have probably relabeled that here. Uh, so the patient will report physical symptoms that can't be explained by a general medical condition or in some cases they uh, report symptoms or complain of symptoms or obsess over symptoms that are disproportionate to their general medical condition. Objective testing is normal or not in proportion with the patient's complaints. The symptoms interfere with their quality of life or with their ability to function. Uh, frequently, we will diagnose comorbid anxiety disorders in these patients, as I'm sure you can imagine, since anxiety features prominently in these, uh, in these somatic symptom disorders. So even just going back here, you can see that one of these is called illness anxiety disorder. So you can imagine in these patients, anxiety disorders are probably pretty frequent relative to the general population. 
Uh, it's idiopathic. We don't know what causes any of these, and so that makes it somewhat difficult to treat. Usually, we rely on psychotherapy. And that, as as important as psychotherapy is, and it is very effective in certain disorders, it is true that we kind of throw patients that we really don't know how to treat them medically, we throw them to a psychotherapist, and for better or for worse. Uh, these disorders are slightly more common in women, and that may be a bias based on the fact that women tend to uh, come are, are more likely to come in and seek help compared to men, and that's sort of a Western behavioral thing. Uh, but that's what we have right now. These are diagnoses of exclusion. That's very important because anytime a patient comes in complaining about something, we need to check them and make sure that it's not something uh, organic that warrants treatment. And that's a big medical legal thing for you too. If you have a patient that comes in complaining about something and you don't check them over and document it in the patient's notes and in their records, you can run into some major money loss, liability issues. So this is always diagnosis of exclusion. And that goes for a lot of psychiatry. We always have to rule out general medical conditions and drugs as a potential precipitator of these disorders. So the somatic symptom disorders we're going to talk about include somatic symptom disorder. Now, this note that this falls under the umbrella of somatic symptom disorders, which include all the rest of these. But somatic symptom disorder is what we used to know as somatization disorder. Uh, this includes the subclassification of somatic symptom disorder with predominant pain, formerly known as pain disorder, illness anxiety disorder, formerly known as hypochondriasis, conversion disorder, and then I will talk here about body dysmorphic disorder since it used to be classified under the somatoform disorders, although now it is classified under the obsessive, compulsive, and related disorders. I'll also talk about something that I consider quote-unquote, non-somatoform disorders. I prefer that terminology. That's what I learned from the psychiatrist I work around. Uh, but factitious disorder, if you do go into the DSM-5, it is, uh, it is, the criteria are given under the somatic symptom disorders. Malingering, on the other hand, is really not uh, at all related to the somatic symptom disorders. This is really just a patient trying to take advantage of you. All right, so somatic symptom disorder is a condition involving a somatic symptom that is distressing, uh, resulting in significant disruption of daily life. So it has to be distressing to the patient, and it has to disrupt their daily life. Now, the nice thing is here, it is just a somatic symptom. It isn't the four pain symptoms, blah, 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 that we used to have to remember. We don't have to remember that anymore. Now all we need to know is that it just needs to be one or more somatic symptoms that are distressing, resulting in significant disruption of daily life. And coming into the doctor every week is a disruption of the patient's daily life. The differential for somatic symptom disorder, what you need to consider really is anything based on the specific symptom. So I can't list everything here because it depends on if the patient is complaining about belly ache or if they're complaining that they think they're going blind or if they're complaining that their foot hurts, etc. Uh, so really anything based on the specific symptoms. Other things to think of are multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis can manifest in various neurologic symptoms, and neurologic symptoms tend to be what the patient complains of when they come in with somatic symptom disorder. It doesn't have to be, but because multiple sclerosis can cause a constellation of seemingly otherwise unrelated neurologic symptoms, it's something that you may want to consider when you have a patient with a constellation of neurologic symptoms. So things you can see in multiple sclerosis as far as presenting are visual deficits, eye pain, um, you may need an MRI to exclude multiple sclerosis, but make sure that you're doing a decent workup um, and don't just jump to MRI. It's an expensive test, so make sure that you have a, a history here and that you really have serious neurologic issues. And typically, when you have a patient with multiple sclerosis, the neurologic issues are going to be, uh, they're, they're going to be objective rather than subjective. Okay, so somatic symptom disorder, as we mentioned, is a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning we need to exclude any organic medical condition. The management, once you've diagnosed a patient with somatic symptom disorder, is to coordinate care with regularly scheduled visits to one primary physician. You don't want these patients going off to multiple different physicians, seeing doctors 
uh, in four or five different hospitals because that's not only going to uh, cost a lot of money and cause the patient to undergo unnecessary tests, but it also isn't going to give a lot of regular reassurance to the patient that indeed there's nothing wrong. If you have five or six different doctors, they're not going to know that this is necessarily somatic symptom disorder and have that continuance of care where they can uh, form that diagnosis and reassure the patient because the patient's going to be relatively new to them. So that's why it's good to have regularly scheduled visits to reassure the patient and one primary physician coordinating care. It's generally good for any patient to have one primary physician as sort of their care coordinator. Um, and so it's just as important, if not more so, with the somatic symptom disorder patients. Uh, and then also individual psychotherapy can be useful uh, in addition. So what we used to know as pain disorder, now we know as somatic symptom disorder under the subclassification of somatic symptom disorder with predominant pain, is characterized by chronic pain in one or more areas that's not explained by a general medical condition. In this case, you have a patient with somatic symptom disorder, uh, but pain is the, pr the prominent complaint. So, whereas a patient with just regular old somatic symptom disorder may complain of they feel they're going blind, or they feel they're losing their hearing, or uh, they fear they have uh, that this growth on their arm, this mole, is cancer, uh, these patients, pain is the prominent complaint. So often this will follow an actual physical trauma, but the pain will persist well after visible healing. Uh, these are all very similar uh, characterizations to what we had with pain disorder. Uh, analgesics are not helpful. Usually there are comorbid psychiatric conditions present, such as uh, major depressive disorder or dysthymia. Uh, and then the differential can include uh, things such as fibromyalgia, which I'm going to talk about at the very end just as an aside here. Fibromyalgia, the pain will be associated with specific trigger points, and this is a big deal. Um, fibromyalgia is not a somatic symptom disorder. Uh, and then also, uh, I probably should have changed this, uh, somatic symptom disorder. Patients with somatic symptom disorder uh, will have a... Uh, they'll have a specific complaint and it's not associated with pain. So I should have updated this. But hopefully you understand the difference. Uh, whereas we used to have somatization disorder and pain disorder as two separate entities, we now recognize that they're actually very similar and so we've kind of collapsed them into pain disorder being a subset of somatic symptom disorder which we now call somatic symptom disorder with predominant pain. Uh, so really, the difference between somatic symptom disorder with predominant pain and then just regular old somatic symptom disorder is that patients with somatic symptom disorder with predominant pain, pain will be the prominent complaint, the predominant complaint, okay? So the management is to validate the patient's complaints because pain is indeed subjective, so it's not up to us to tell them that they're in pain or not in pain. We'll do individual psychotherapy foremost, and then we can also do biofeedback or SSRIs. What we don't want to do is give this patient continuous analgesics. Remember that analgesics are, if they're not helpful, we don't want to keep throwing them at these patients. There's risk for dependency. There's other side effects, constipation to being on opioid analgesics. So we don't want these patients on something that's not going to help them. At the same time, we do want to validate their complaints and we send them off in a direction that's more likely to help them. Conversion disorder is uh, one or more neurological symptoms that can't be explained by a general medical condition. This is associated with a high level of anxiety uh, or an acute stressor, but once they convert into these neurological symptoms, they have a tendency to not be as worked up about it as you might be if you were seeing this patient for the first time. So let me explain this. This is what's called la belle indifference, which is French for the beautiful indifference. Uh, so you have a patient that you are seeing for the very first time, and let's say you're working in neurology service. I, I'm actually giving you a real life vignette here that I actually experienced. So you're working in the neurology service. You come in, it's Monday. It's your very first time seeing some of these patients. This is a patient you're seeing for the very first time. And this patient suddenly developed hemiparalysis on their uh, left side. However, the patient is completely fine with it. That is la belle indifference, and that is a 
very distinguishing feature of conversion disorder. So if you were to wake up tomorrow morning and you were paralyzed on one side of your body or let's say from the waist down, you would probably be pretty distressed about it. Patients with conversion disorder, although they may be distressed about what they're experiencing, there is a subset of the population with conversion disorder that has this beautiful indifference where they're not nearly, their affect is not nearly congruent as to what we would expect with somebody who suddenly developed these apparently uh, severe manifestations. So the symptoms of conversion disorder can vary how it manifests in a specific patient. Deafness, blindness, or mutism tend to be the most common. Uh, I actually also saw a patient with conversion disorder that was completely mute, and uh, that was strange. But he was also not at all concerned about it, and that was a that was a set off to the fact that this was probably conversion disorder. And indeed, it was. We didn't find any other. Uh, features that were consistent with a neurological condition. Poor coordination and then paralysis of an arm or a leg not fitting in with a specific anatomic injury. Uh, so usually when you have a patient with paralysis or with, uh, with anesthesia or with uh, lack of sensation of a given area, we can usually correlate it to a specific neurological lesion. So MCA stroke, we would expect weakness on one side of, uh, of the body in the upper extremities. Uh, other spinal cord lesions can be uh, involved too, like syringomyelia with the cape-like distribution of, of, of loss and sensation, etc. So if they're not in fitting with a specific anatomic injury, you can look towards conversion disorder, but you definitely have to rule these things out. So that brings me to uh, what you need to do to get to conversion disorder, you need to rule out general medical conditions. And you'll do this based on symptoms. Uh, so things you want to rule out are things such as a brain tumor, which can uh, the symptoms can come on suddenly. Uh, you can do that with a CT. Dementia, you can do with a CT in history. Optic neuritis uh, and multiple sclerosis. Uh, if you need to get an MRI, you can get that. Myasthenia gravis, you can get uh, with EMG or serology, uh, lupus is going to have systemic symptoms, and then malingering if there's any possibility of secondary gain, and usually you'll get that in your history. But based on the patient's presentation, you need to rule out general medical conditions. Because this has such a wide variety of ways it can present, I can't possibly include all the things that you need to rule out. You really just need to base it on clinical judgment and the individual patient. This is a diagnosis of exclusion, as I alluded to, and management is with reassurance and individual psychotherapy focused on reducing anxiety. Illness anxiety disorder we used to know as, uh, as uh, hypochondriasis, and this is characterized by intense preoccupation for at least six months that has not changed with a particular symptom or symptoms despite repeated professional reassurance. So this, in, in this case, unlike the somatic symptom disorders, these patients don't necessarily have to have symptoms. They're concerned about getting symptoms or getting a specific illness. So they're preoccupied with a particular symptom or symptoms. The symptom or symptoms may not be a complaint to them in that they're experiencing stomach pain or they're experiencing uh, the, a loss of hearing or they're experiencing certain things. It's a preoccupation with something that they may have or that they fear they may get. Preoccupation is the key word here. And this is all despite repeated professional reassurance. The DSM-5 criteria departs somewhat significantly from the DSM-4TR criteria. The DSM-5 criteria are a little bit more stringent. So first of all, there has to be a preoccupation with having or acquiring a serious illness. Okay, so preoccupation is really the operant word here. Uh, somatic symptoms are either not present, or if they are present, they're only mild in intensity. If another medical condition is present, or there's a high risk for developing a medical condition, so let's say they're really obsessed with developing breast cancer, and they're coming in every two months because they feel like they're experiencing a breast mass or they're just concerned and they feel like they need to get another mammography. Um, even though they may have a family history present, 
the preoccupation has to be excessive or disproportionate to their current state. So this, somewhat similar to the somatic symptom disorder uh, reclassification, uh, if you will, we have changed the, uh, the criteria for illness anxiety disorder to include patients that not necessarily don't have any kind of relation to what they're complaining about. Maybe they do have a medical condition or they do have a family history, but their complaints and their preoccupation is excessive or disproportionate to their current state of being. Uh, criteria on C, there's a high level of anxiety about health. That kind of comes under the anxiety uh, facet of this disorder. The individual performs excessive health-related behaviors or exhibits maladaptive avoidance. You can see here how this is somewhat similar to the somatic symptom disorder. E, it needs to be present for at least six months. And then F, it's not better explained by another mental disorder, including somatic symptom disorder, panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, body dysmorphic disorder, OCD, or delusional disorder, somatic type. How do you distinguish this from somatic symptom disorder? I kind of talked about that uh, a little bit ago, but uh, with somatic symptom disorder, they have present symptoms. With illness anxiety disorder, they're preoccupied with either developing a symptom uh, or symptoms or preoccupied with developing an illness. All right, so moving on here. So the differential uh, includes delusional disorder, somatic type. Uh, typically, these preoccupations will be bizarre. And then somatic symptom disorder, and kind of get rid of some of this here. This is old. I didn't update this. Uh, but I explained the difference between this and somatic symptom disorder. Management for illness anxiety is reassurance with regularly scheduled visits and psychotherapy, much like how we manage patients with somatic symptom disorder. Body dysmorphic disorder is no longer classified under uh, the formerly known so, uh, somatoform disorders, now the somatic symptom disorders. It's now classified under the obsessive compulsive and related disorders. Uh, primarily because we see OCD a lot in patients with body dysmorphic disorder and there's uh, a high comorbidity. So that's why we reclassified it, but its definition and criteria remain the same. So it's a preoccupation with a specific body part or parts, believing that it's, mis it's misformed or abnormal, despite convincing and objective evidence that it is not. So I had a very good friend when I was in medical school who had a preoccupation with his nose <laughs> and I kind of maybe guilt guiltfully had a little bit of fun with this and you know used to pet his nose and called him a horse <laughs> but, sorry but anyhow um, this typically uh, when patients come at you with this they'll be referring to specific parts of their body and the most common are skin hair nose and weight uh, nose I have personally seen uh, but skin, so these patients who complain about their skin may be obsessed with even small blemishes in their skin. Uh, so maybe they have a birthmark on their face, and it's just a tiny birthmark, but to them it is absolutely disfiguring. Uh, hair, so this is something that we see a lot in men. So guy hits 30, 35 years old, starts to develop male pattern baldness, maybe even a little bit earlier. It might just be a little bit of a widow's peak. He sees himself as just disgustingly disfigure, disfigurably balding. Um, so, uh, and then weight, of course, this, uh, when it's body dysmorphic disorder relating to weight, these patients are at high risk for developing eating disorders. Uh, so skin, hair, nose, and weight are respectively the most common. Uh, they are associated with anxiety disorders, especially OCD, and that is why we have reclassified this under uh, to be under the umbrella of uh, the obsessive compulsive disorders. Differential disorder includes delusional disorder, somatic type. So this is the diagnosis of the preoccupation is bizarre. So these patients, if they think uh, I'm, I've got this spot on my skin, I must be turning into a frog, and they're convinced of that. That is delusional disorder, somatic type. Anorexia nervosa. This is a big one here. So the patient wrongly views themselves as over, overweight, body dysmorphic disorder, and they show signs of malnutrition 
uh, or a BMI of under 17.5. This is no longer body dysmorphic disorder. This is anorexia nervosa. Uh, these patients are malnourished. Uh, if you ask them, invariably, they're going to be uh, not eating or binging, purging, etc. Obsessive compulsive disorder. These patients will engage in compulsion to relieve anxiety about the body part. Management is individual psychotherapy. You can use SSRIs, but psychotherapy is really going to be the most helpful here because what they have is a uh, what they have here is a cognitive behavioral roadblock, uh, and psychotherapy is very well tailored to uh, relieve that. Okay, so now going on to these uh, these what I like to call non-somatoform disorders, but uh, factitious disorder is indeed in the DSM-5 uh, listed and its criteria are listed under the uh, somatic symptom disorder uh, uh, umbrella. Uh, factitious disorder is often known as Munchausen syndrome. And in this case, the patient is consciously producing the symptoms, but not for secondary gain. So this is important when we come to malingering and determining uh, differentiating the two of these apart, and the USMLE loves to give you questions that will require you to distinguish factitious disorder from malingering. So in the case of factitious disorder, the patient is consciously producing the symptoms, just like in malingering, but it's not for secondary gain. A lot of times these patients, and when we say secondary gain, what we're talking about are things outside the hospital. So financial assistance, shelter, welfare, pain medication, disability, sick leave from work, and so forth. A lot of times these patients with factitious disorder want to play the sick role and have attention. And that is not considered secondary gain uh, as far as our definition here. So if they want, if, if what they want is to assume the sick role and receive medical attention, and that is the reason for producing the symptoms, what they have is factitious disorder. Okay, that wanting to play the sick role is not malingering. Okay, malingering is for something outside the hospital. Like I said, you know, getting disability, getting a sick, uh, getting a, a, a letter so they don't have to go in for work. That's malingering. Also be aware of Munchausen syndrome by proxy. If you are a pediatrician or you're working pediatrics or you're a pediatric nurse for sure because you're probably going to come into contact with, with uh, parents a lot more than physicians will. Be around them. Just the amount of hours you're going to spend with the patient will be much more than the physician. You want to be aware of Munchausen syndrome by proxy. And what this is, is and typically it's it's, it's seen parents over their children, but it can be seen in, uh, in people who are taking care of maybe their elderly parents. What this is is that you are feigning symptoms in the patient uh, in order to get the attention uh, of parent of sick child. So here's a good example. Child comes in for a checkup or... Um, parent brings the child in because uh, of suspected urinary tract infection and while the child is uh, while the child is doing the urinalysis uh, giving the urine specimen the parent surreptitiously uh, puts some blood into the urine that looks just like factitious disorder except here we don't have the patient doing it it's somebody else doing it for the patient so it's Essentially, it's Munchausen syndrome, but it's you're trying to get the sick role and get attention by doing it to somebody else. Okay, hopefully I made that make sense to you. All right, the differential includes malingering. So we'll talk about malingering on the next slide, uh, but hopefully I'll make uh, that clear to you as well, what malingering is. I kind of alluded to it already. Management for factitious disorder is, uh, or Munchausen syndrome, same thing, uh, is with psychotherapy focused on the underlying cause of motivation. So some of these patients will uh, be attention deprived. Uh, maybe they have low self-esteem. Maybe they're depressed. Uh, there may be underlying psychiatric conditions and often are underlying psychiatric conditions uh, behind this. So if we can treat the root cause, um, then we've uh, done the patient well. Malingering. So this is, oh, and you know what? Actually, let me bring this up here. Um, if you have a case of Munchausen syndrome by proxy, in that case, you may have real abuse going on. So let's say that a parent caused 
a uh, let's say that a parent causes an illness in a child. Let's say they you know break their arm, and that may look just like uh, that may look just like a regular old uh, Munchausen syndrome by proxy. But indeed, that's abuse. Okay, so you need to be aware that there is a fine line, especially when it comes to parents with their children, uh, but also if it's people taking care of, uh, of infirmed or elderly people, um, that there is really a fine line between Munchausen syndrome by proxy and abuse. So if they're actually causing bodily harm to the patient, then this is crossed into abuse. And even though it still may be Munchausen syndrome by proxy because they're seeking attention, uh, it is also abuse. So you need to be aware of that. Okay, so malingering, this is a conscious production of symptoms, but in this case, it's in order to obtain secondary gain. This is not a disorder. This is a patient taking advantage of you as a physician for what you can do for them, and that might be uh, documentation for Social Security. That might be a documentation so they can get out of work or out of jury duty uh, or something like that, or it may be very commonly prescription for pain medication. So they may have symptoms, but they'll exaggerate it. That can be really difficult to distinguish uh, reality from malingering. Um, but really, you just have to take into consideration the patient's case and their history. And um, you also have to be very, 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 very careful about ever writing down malingering on a patient's chart. Because once you write down malingering on a patient's chart, that's going to follow them for a long time. And now that we have electronic medical records, if malingering is ever put on their chart, physicians are, from here on out, going to be very skeptical about anything this patient comes in complaining of. And that is problematic because if a patient, part of this is, you know, it's the onus is on us to make sure that we're doing a full workup anytime the patient comes in. Even if a patient in the past has had malingering, they're coming in complaining of chest pain and they're sweating, yes, you still need to do an EKG. But be very careful about making this diagnosis because this can follow the patient for the rest of their life. Um, the management for malingering is through gentle guidance and polite dialogue. Do not provide the secondary gain. So don't write out pain medication if it's not necessary. If they're truly not sick and it's very clear that they're malingering, don't write them a sick note because if you provide secondary gain to them, you are basically reinforcing their behavior and they're just going to come in and do it again. All right, so we want to avoid direct and blunt confrontation because that can raise a security threat, uh, but you have to be gentle with these patients because uh, these patients as well may, for one reason or another, maybe it's unrelated to the reason they're malingering, but they may also have psychiatric conditions. So any patient, regardless of whether they're malingering or not, they need to be treated humanely. Um, and so just because these patients are trying to take advantage of you does not give you license to treat them poorly. So just to review, uh, the somatoform disorders or the somatic symptom disorders as we know them now, uh, the symptom production is subconscious and the patient's motivation is subconscious. The factitious disorders and malingering, the symptom production is conscious but in the case of the patient's motivation with factitious disorder, it's subconscious. They don't know why they're doing it. Uh, even, though, even though they're consciously producing whatever's there, they really don't know why they're doing it. With malingering, they do. So let's do some cases here just to kind of clarify these. A 36-year-old man returns to his internist for the fifth time in nine months, complaining of numbness in his toes and indigestion. Although his medical workup has been unremarkable, he is now concerned about celiac disease and re requests a GI consult. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? A. Somatic symptom disorder. B. Somatic symptom disorder with predominant pain. C. Body dysmorphic disorder. D. Illness anxiety disorder. Or E. Conversion disorder. Okay, so I'll give you some time to pause it here. And the answer is... D, illness anxiety disorder. So we have a patient coming in with complaints. Uh, he's complaining of numbness in his toes and indigestion. Now, that may make you think somatic symptom disorder. However, it's really not connected to what he is ultimately asking for. He is concerned about a specific disease. That pushes you towards illness anxiety disorder. 
If you took out, he is now concerned about cel celiac disease and requests a GI consult, and he came in for the, for the fifth time in nine months with these complaints of numbness in his toes and indigestion, even though his workup had been completely unremarkable, then perhaps we could make a diagnosis of somatic symptom disorder. However, the fact that he's concerned about a specific disorder, even though his symptoms have nothing to do with that disorder, except for maybe the indigestion, um, but his workup has been completely unremarkable up until this point, uh, that pushes you towards illness anxiety disorder. And I probably could have put in here just for completion's sake and would have really solidified this diagnosis, his anti-TTG uh, is negative. Uh, and he's had a uh, endoscopy uh, with uh, biopsy and it was negative for celiac disease, but he's still concerned about celiac disease. That would be an even more textbook example of illness anxiety disorder. Case 2, a 27-year-old woman presents to the ED with second and third degree burns on her right hand and forearm. She says she accidentally spilled boiling water on her arm while reaching for a pot of boiling noodles. When you look at her medical history chart, you find three past occurrences of similar episodes. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? A, somatic symptom disorder, B, factitious disorder, C, delusional disorder, D, malingering, or E, conversion disorder. And we are asking here for the most likely diagnosis. Other diagnoses are possible. But what is the most likely of all of these? Okay, and the answer to this is B, factitious disorder. Now it is possible that this woman may just be irreparably clumsy and, uh, and a uh, total ignoramus in the kitchen, but the fact that if you look at her medical history chart and you see three occurrences of very similar episodes. The most likely diagnosis of all of these is factitious disorder. So this isn't somatic symptom disorder because indeed what she has, uh, pain from second and third degree burns, that's a real thing. I mean, it doesn't take a physician to know that if a patient has burns, they've got, they've got pain. Uh, so it's not somatic symptom disorder. Delusional disorder, it is not also because this is, it's not a delusion. You've got burns, you've got burns. Uh, it's not malingering. She's not asking for anything. Uh, if she was asking for three months worth of pain medication, then possibly malingering. And then conversion disorder. Uh, again, you have burns, uh, so it's not conversion disorder here. Conversion disorder would be if sh if you were to have uh, a set of symptoms, uh, but you have nothing to uh, to explain it. All right. So this is factitious disorder. Okay, so let's do the same thing here. We got the same patient, um, but now you're not looking at the medical, presumably you're looking at the medical history chart, but you don't see any past occurrences of these episodes. You just have a woman with second and third degree burns and she spilt boiling water on her arm while reaching for a pot of boiling noodles. You get into the room and she requests, specifically requests, pain medication and a note for the local judge exempting her from jury duty. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis here? So hopefully this doesn't take you very long to know that this is malingering. Now, yes, it is possible. It is possible that this woman spilt boiling water on her arm and she just happened to have jury duty that day and she just happened to know that she wants pain medication as well. Most likely this is malingering, okay? Especially when a patient, their first concern is not gee, is my arm okay? Am I going to need surgery? What am I going to do? I need to pick up my daughter from school. If their concerns are pain medication and getting a note to get out of work or jury duty, if that's chief on their mind, that points you more towards malingering because here we have secondary gain. Okay, I talked about fibromyalgia earlier, or the fact that it's not a somatic symptom disorder, and I just wanted to briefly point out fibromyalgia here. I have a whole lecture on fibromyalgia, uh, but fibromyalgia, yes, it is a what you could call a pain disorder, but we consider fibromyalgia to actually be organic now. Uh, there are specific areas that these patients overwhelmingly complain of pain at, uh, so one, two, six, eight, 12, 16, 18. Uh, so there's these 18 different spots. 
we do a questionnaire, and I, I didn't put this questionnaire on here. You can look it up uh, from the American College of Rheumatology. Uh, they have all this stuff, but what you basically do is ask them all the points. They have pain for each of these. It's one point if they do indeed have pain there, uh, and you count them up. And then you do an inventory of their symptom severity. It's really just based on how much it interferes with their daily life. And you get a score for both of these. And as you score it, if it's more than sub 7 for the widespread pain index and more than 5 for symptom severity, um, that's considered a diagnosis, provided that their symptoms have uh, been present for more than 3 months and no other disorder can explain the pain. So fibromyalgia is not a somatic symptom disorder. This is not something that we don't really have an answer for. Uh, this is considered a rheumatologic disorder and we treat it as such. It is not a psychiatric disorder. And this is my puppy Axel. I think I put this on the original set of slides that I took like two years ago, um, two and a half years ago. This is quite an old picture of him. Um, he's about four years old now, um, but this is him as a puppy when I first got him. Uh, I moved here. So if you have any questions, uh, certainly there are lots of questions to be had. We just came out with DSM-5. Feel free to let me know. I'll try to answer as many of them as I can. Take care.